Uh, then I'm just going to give a sync. All right, sweet. Here we are. Hello. What's up? Hi. <laughs> Uh, we're here with Alexandra, uh, mm-hmm. and we're going to have a chat about a bunch of different things, kind of going into the philosophy of science, um, and I think discuss topics like what human nature is, um, gender essentialism. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's some of the really interesting stuff you had sent over. Uh, but yeah, why don't, you, why don't you tell us what you do? Hi, guys. Thank you very much for inviting me, and th- thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about my research. So I would like to introduce uh, what I do, since I think it's quite peculiar. So I would like to start with that to uh, uh, explain my perspective uh, when I approach the the problem of human nature or the issue of human nature. So basically, my background is in philosophy. Uh, My bachelor's and master's are in philosophy of science and in analytic philosophy. I also have to specify that. Uh, And then I started a PhD in anthropology. So basically, I do anthropology of science currently, uh, which means that I do empirical research on science and scientific practices. And in that research, I try to somehow integrate the philosophy of science with the anthropology of science. And this is very peculiar and specific because there is like a history of uh, these disciplines not really communicating because they have like different theoretical, ontological, methodological views and perspectives on science. So I try to do that. So and uh, uh, how I do that is that basically I somehow use feminist philosophy of science because I believe that this philosophical perspective on science is more uh, from a theoretical perspective. It's it allows integration with the social studies of science and anthropology of science being one of the disciplines within social studies, social studies of science. So basically, yes, that's that's like my theoretical background, feminist philosophy of science and anthropology of science, empirical research on scientific practices on the other side. So this is like the first integration that I do, which is really the integration of, of different disciplines. And then uh, with this theoretical framework and also an empirical one, I try to discuss uh, integration of specific scientific disciplines. So integration is like a very important part in my work. Uh, And then uh, I try to understand the integration between two disciplines which have like a very uneasy historical uh, relationship. On one side, there is sociocultural anthropology and on the other side, there is evolutionary psychology. So you probably know uh, more than me about the relationship between these two. So that's one of the things that I would like to discuss with you. So basically, uh, I try to understand how to integrate these two perspectives and uh, specifically uh, evolutionary psychologists have provided an argument about conceptual integration and they argue that uh, integration should be the goal of all the sciences and conceptual integration is a specific type of integration where you try to reach external consistency between the disciplines that were previously inconsistent or competing. So, and what I would like to do in my research, and I hope that uh, I will succeed in that, is to uh, examine the practice of evolutionary psychology, evolutionary psychologists, to see whether they really try to reach this conceptual integration. And yes, and I forgot to say the important thing, uh, they argue that conceptual integration or external consistency is reached when the di- two disciplines that are competing somehow adjust their theoretical assumptions. And this process is symmetrical. They try to adjust their theoretical assumptions in order to reach this external consistency. So basically, I'm focusing only on evolutionary psychology. So I'm not examining and investigating what this other side is doing, whether uh, anthropologists try to reach evolutionary social science, evolutionary psychology, because I think that since evolutionary psychologists put forward this argument, uh, I would like to see whether they are following their theoretical beliefs uh, and assumptions. And yes, and the idea is that I do interviews with them. And then through interviews, I would ask questions about their attitudes towards, and I hope that they will not uh, uh, listen to this interview before I approach mm-hmm. them and do the interviews with them. Yes, so basically that's the idea, that I do interviews with them. And then uh, also... Uh, like a side project, which I would also like to mention if that's okay, Mm -hmm. uh, is that I also try to do a bit of scientometrics. And scientometrics, so it's very interesting, so that's why I wanted to brought it up. So anthropology of science is basically, or social studies of science are basically the qualitative uh, analysis of science. So you use qualitative methods in order to 
investigate scientific practices. Mm -hmm. So basically, like the paradigmatic example is Bruno Latour's examination of scientific labs. So you like a, you do a, a micro analysis of science when you use quanti qualitative uh, methodology. And then on the other side, you have scientometrics, which is a quantitative analysis of science. And here you have like a macro level on scientific practices. You take a macro approach. So you're not uh, focusing on specific, sorry, specific scientific disciplines or specific labs, but you like have a more macro view on the scientific thing. And then in, in particular in my research, uh, I will try to understand, well, to look uh, how uh, evolutionary, so in the past 30 years, let's say, since the publication about conceptual integration was put forward, uh, I will try to see whether in the top evolutionary psychology journals, papers that have been published there have the references to evolutionary, uh, uh, to, sorry, uh, sociocultural anthropology. So whether the papers in these top journals have the references, where these references are the famous or the big or the important papers from sociocultural anthropology, because this would be one of the indicators whether they try somehow to communicate or to see what's happening in evolutionary, or oh, sorry, in sociocultural anthropology in order to maybe adjust their views to that. So I would like to see what's happening with the numbers and then to see in these particular papers written by evolutionary psychologists how they are using uh, sociocultural anthropology in their work. And my assumption is, in fact, that they are not trying to approach them. <laughs> so let's see. So this is basically my research. So, and I proposed like, a topic on human nature since I think that human nature is really what is at the core of the issue here, since these two disciplines, evolutionary uh, psychology, and sociocultural anthropology, they basically have different views on human nature, and that's the, at the core of their disagreement. And then since I also do a bit of feminist philosophy of science, and feminist philosophy of science historically somehow is connected to the feminist critique on human nature, on theories about human nature. So this is also one of the perspectives on human nature that's quite connected to evolution, to sociocultural anthropology. In, in, so both are critical towards the existence of human nature, which uh, evolutionary psychology presupposes. Mm -hmm. So this is like a overview on everything. So how how uh, I I approach this issue of human nature. So. So you're looking at uh, whether or not different fields of of the sciences actually try to reach some kind of cohesion theoretically, and then you're ag you're also uh, as a. Uh, in a quantitative way, approaching uh, science, trying to find out what the metrics are to be able to analyze that. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're taking a scientific approach to look at the methods of science itself, in a sense? Uh, it's more precise to say practices. Practices, yeah, yes. okay, cool. Yes. Uh, with the point being that with, with disciplines that deal with the same level of explanation, in mm -hmm. some sense, mm -hmm. ideally there would be sort of unified theories Mm -hmm. at, at every level of explanation, and then ideally, obviously, some, a through line between mm -hmm. every other level of explanation. Mm -hmm. So you're you're dealing specifically with uh, the anthropology and um, evolutionary psychology. Mm -hmm. So basically, at the same level of explanation, they should be able to integrate some understanding of, I guess, human nature is Let's see. both both their topics. Yes, human nature or specific social behaviors. So right. social cool. behaviors are the like the core thing that evolutionary psychology tries to explain uh, with the use of evolutionary theory. So and social behaviors are also at the center of anthropology anthropological research. So well uh, culture is at the center of anthropological research but you try to understand culture through observing social behaviors. So that's basically like they have this, they are investigating the same phenomena, the same thing, mm -hmm. but in that, uh, in that endeavor, they provide competing explanations because they start from different competing theoretical assumptions. So that's my understanding of the issue, even though I could, so that, but that's how I understand the thing. And that's, I think, what philosophers of science, how they approach the whole criticism of evolutionary psychology, even though. Sometimes I also get skeptical a bit uh, about this, like a philosophical critique of evolutionary psychology, because I feel that maybe they're not really always using the the strongest uh, the strongest theories or the strongest approaches or perspectives in evolutionary psychology. I think they're always arguing against the 
maybe strong, you know, providing straw man arguments, not arguing against the weakest, the uh, the what the strongest evolutionary psychology there is currently in the field happening. Can you give us an example? A example of the critiques that yes, are put forward. Yes. Well, the common critique, and I'm not really sure what. I I have to investigate it more thoroughly, to be honest. So the common critique that philosophers of science put forward is that evolutionary psychology also is committed uh, committed to uh, genetic determinism. So because, so just to give a bit of the context, so evolutionary psychology is basically like uh, one of the perspectives within the evolutionary social science, and evolutionary psychology is the predecessor. Is that the word? So came after sociobiology. And sociobiology is like a huge thing in the history of of the life sciences. So sociobiology is basically the claim of uh, Wilson, uh, Edward Wilson put like a uh, de- design. I don't know how to say it. Like uh, he uh, wrote a very thick book uh, called Sociobiology: The Modern Synth- Synthesis. Mm-hmm. And the last chapter of that. So the whole book is about the uh, social behavior of animals, and he claimed that you can explain social behavior of animals by applying the principle of natural selection directly to that behavior. So basically, he assumed that social behaviors could be uh, explained. The evolution, their evolution, could be explained in the same way how you explain the evolution of human species. So of the natural properties of human species. So I hope I'm being precise enough. And in the last chapter of that very thick book, he argued that you can use the evolutionary approach, the the principle of evolution by natural selection, to explain also the social behavior of humans. And then uh, he also argued uh, quite explicitly that uh, this uh, will be the last step in the integration of all the disciplines or sciences that deal with humans. So basically, he argued that if we use uh, the principle uh, of natural selection uh, in the explanation of human social behavior, then sociology, uh, anthropology, even ethics could be reduced to uh, evolutionary biology, populational biology, genetics. And so he basically proposed uh, a very reductionist claim, arguing that all these social scientific disciplines can be reduced and should be reduced to more these hard sciences, biological sciences. And that was uh, quite problematic because you are completely disregarding the whole aut- autonomy, integrity of a very big field of knowledge. So, and then that was extremely controversial, uh, also had some a very uh, problematic political uh, con- uh, like very so problematic from the political perspective mm-hmm. and that's also connected to this whole issue of human nature and uh, justifying the status quo in societies and then basically from uh, yes and he was criticized by everyone so anthropologists uh, philosophers of science other biologists uh, evolutionary biologists and the common critique is that the shared critique uh, is that uh, it's an empirically inadequate. Uh, I'm not pronouncing it quite nice, but you understand me. So uh, that like it's not a, a empirically uh, good from an empirical side because you're completely disregarding the causal influence in, of culture in explaining these social behaviors. So you're basically not providing the empirically uh, adequate theory because you're disregarding the empirical data, which tells you that you have a huge causal influence of culture if you would like to explain social behaviors. So then after this like a uh, very intense hi- historical debate, evolutionary psychology was put forward as like a, uh, as a new uh, evolutionary social science that uh, doesn't argue that the genes are at the core of social behavior, but the cognitive mechanisms. Mm-hmm. However, these cognitive mechanisms are being uh, determined by genes. And then uh, that's the reason why philosophers of science still argue that even though they are not uh, referring to genes anymore, and re- they are referring to cognitive mechanisms uh, which are the main reason why certain social behaviors exist, uh, still uh, this evolutionary psychology implies genetic determinism Mm -hmm. because you have like genes at uh, the background of these cognitive mechanisms which are evolved, adaptive, and so on and so forth. So 
is it like this. So that that's basically what philosophers of science argue. And uh, evolutionary psychologists uh, are not arguing that they are genetic determinists. However, so and this whole idea of conceptual integration, as I understand it, is basically uh, them cl claiming, no, we are not reductionists. We are not claiming that uh, social science needs to be reduced to evolutionary biology. We recognize the autonomy of uh, social science. However, we are proposing conceptual integration because we believe that all sciences needs to be, uh, that the, sci the sciences about the human needs to be integrated. So conceptual integration is like one uh, specific way to approach the criticism about genetic determinism or genetic reductionism. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the... Yeah, I was going actually to ask you if you could uh, identify historical a point or or cause for the divide because if if two scientists are investigating the same phenomena mm -hmm. um intuitively mm -hmm. you think that at some point they start to converge right mm -hmm. but um well i think you put it very well where mm -hmm. it happened mm -hmm. um i don't know if you would would add anything else to that like to to the historical context on where the divide starts to 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 happen or, but also, if there is anything else on modern science mm -hmm. that um, contribute to, to, to those um, um, conceptual distinctions, that's an ongoing process of differentiation. Mm -hmm. um, may, maybe, maybe, the, um, maybe what, it, what you just said, that the, the critic maybe is not at a point, it's not at, a, at the precise point, but um, if you have anything else to add to that, because, uh, yeah, I was curious to, to co kind of like um, uh, process it in, in a way that, well, I believe that if we are investigating the same kind of thing, we start to see things that are similar to mm -hmm. each other at some point, if we are open-minded enough mm -hmm. to get there. But um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's bit, so since... Uh, uh, so uh, the first point about the, so how identifying the, like, uh, when the, the divide, uh, was like happened. Mm -hmm. So uh, Wilson's publication is definitely a very obvious divide breaking point between these two, mm -hmm. but I think the historical, so the, uh, so the evolutionary theory in anthropology, sociocultural anthropology has like a very important, the, is taking a very important part in the development. So evolutionary theory is an important part in the development of anthropological theory. So, and then you have 19th century sociocultural anthropology, which, which was basically uh, an evolutionary account of uh, the development of human societies. So in the, so it's a very interesting history of how the anthropology developed, the historical development of the discipline. So in the 19th century, uh, anthropology used the evolutionary framework in order to argue, in fact, that all peoples, regardless of uh, the culture they belong to, uh, are one human species, one humankind. And then you have there like the claim, which is called the psychic unity of mankind. And the psychic unity of man mankind was the claim which was uh, an anti-racist claim, in fact, a claim against the racist attitudes that people from different cultures, in fact, are different races or different species. So in this claim about the psychic unity of mankind, which was an evolutionary claim, uh, was there to show that regardless of the culture we belong to, we are, ho we are the same human species. However, the 19th century anthropology was also very ethnocentric which meant that people from the UK and the US, basically, I and think, France. Uh, probably France, yes, they traveled to the colonized countries, they did their uh, investigation of other cultures, and they started from a very ethnocentric assumption that uh, their culture is the more developed one. And then when you have this evolutionary uh, framework or the evolutionary perspective, they argued that an, uh, an evolutionary perspective, this is very much uh, uh, similar to what Lamarck was claiming with this unilinear evolution. Mm -hmm. So they argued that uh, we are all the same species, however, uh, different cultures, and they are not only different, they are also one is superior 
to another. So there you have superior cultures and inferior and different ones. Different stages of development. Yes, the different stages of development, which are normatively laden, laden. So you know so, and then this different cultural development indicates different biological development, mm -hmm. and then basically from a very uh, anti-racist attitudes, you ended up again claiming something that is very racist. So and this is 19th century an uh, anthropology. So you have like the this different stages of development. Uh, some are some are at the top. That's pr usually the culture of the researcher, and then at the bottom are these other cultures. And then that's basically how evolutionary uh, thinking uh, took part in the uh, sociocultural anthropology in the 19th century. And then in the 20th century, with Franz Boas, the holding completely changed. First, you had Alfred Kreber, uh, who argued that uh, cultural development or cu cultural evolution happens independently of biological development. So you have this like conceptual decoupling of nature and culture. And previously, with the 19th century anthropology, these two uh, were coupled together. Because if you notice the cultural development of one culture in comparison to other, then that it indicates also the biological development. So cultural and bio biology are taken together and they uh, somehow are taken as indicators of one, of one and the other. And with Alfred Kreber, who argues that the cultural evolution happens completely independently of biological one, then you are not able to use the differences in cultures to argue about the differences in biological endowment. And then with Franz Boas, you have the uh, final, like the final uh, exclusion of evolutionary thinking, I would say, maybe I'm not using the precise terminology here, but like he completely disregard, disregarded, I would argue, evolutionary thinking in anthropology and proposed like this big claim of cultural relativism and arguing that all cultures are different. And if you would like to understand the beliefs and thinking and uh, scientific theories and of other cultures, you have to approach them from within. Mm -hmm. And that's also a very big methodological divide because he argued, so in, with evolutionary thinking in anthropology, you're able to compare cultures and with cultural relativism, this comparison is not really possible because you understand every culture as an island. You know, so, mm -hmm. so, and the whole question is, uh, you ask me like, what, what's like the historically, what would be the divide? So you see, like the tension with evolutionary thinking in anthropology was present before Wilson, mm -hmm. and then also one of the issues why uh, anthropologists tend to be very emotional when you mention sociobiology uh, is because uh, ev uh, anthropology also had its problems with establishing the autonomy of the field. And Kreber was also very important historically because when he argued that cultural evolution happens independently of biological, then he put culture as like the thing to be explained and also as the thing that explains. So he established evolutionary uh, uh, sociocultural anthropology as an autonomous field. And that was happening. So he wrote his paper, The Superorganic, in 1917. So that was almost 60 years before uh, Edward Wilson. And he was then, and the race of genetics was happening at the time of Kreber's writing. So he needed some theoretical justification of why uh, sociocultural anthropology uh, has its own autonomy. So why th this autonomy should be granted to, to this discipline. And then with Wilson, he put forward an argument about genetic determinism, genetic reductionism that completely disregarded the whole historical fight for the autonomy of the discipline. And also one important thing there is that in the 19th century anthropology, which argued, you know, like different cultures uh, could be have different stages of development, some are superior and inferior, that was also one of the ways how scientifically, the whole political thing that was happening at the time, mainly colonization, was justified on a scientific basis. So you have like a different ways how anthropology was criticized, like as a political tool, or, and then Kreber who tried to secure the autonomy, and then Wilson who completely disregarded everything that was happening within this discipline, which was extremely rich. So yes, so that's that's the whole issue about the, this divide. 
And the second thing, uh, and this is about human nature and like a feminist criticism of it that's connected also to the anthropological one, because anthropology is still very politicized field. Now anthropology is there to argue that, no, 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 everything that you perceive is not because of our biology, but because of our culture. Therefore, since culture lacks stability, we can change our culture, change our behaviors, and the present state of of order does not need to exist. So it's a very social constructivist approach on social reality. And then feminists uh, propose the similar criticism to evolutionary psychology, which is basically that if you're arguing that there is some human nature and that the present order of things in society is the consequence of our human nature, therefore the present order of things should stay the same, should be as it is. And the present order of things from the feminist perspective is usually patriarchal, competitive, uh, unequal, unjust, and so on and so forth. So I hope that <laughs> I'm being clear with all these like, uh, perspectives and things that are happening. So I will stop now. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. Sorry yeah. for... Um, yeah, yeah I, I, wonder, I wonder why. Um, I agree the Wilson's um, uh, genetic reductionism is problematic, but um, there were many other things going on in anthropology by the onset of it. Mm -hmm. So, for example, why functionalism and structural functionalism died when Boas take over Mm -hmm. the discipline? That's an interesting case for me. Um, Because for me, well, there is still trying to find universals, right? Until, Mm -hmm. Until... uh, well, m- many of them trying to find uh, on on the institutions uh, um, of marriage or whatever, or even finding out on religion what kind of uh, purpose it serves on many different societies. And um, I believe there is there a kind of a naturalist mm-hmm. perspective on culture that uh, it doesn't it doesn't have to have any claim on uh, genetic reductionism at all, mm-hmm. right? It, it has to be. Uh, some it is is a different approach than um what Boas uh, and Kroba uh, and the followers proposed of uh, of a uh, of a uh, nihilist uh, subjectivism mm-hmm. completely just uh, so that's that wonders me why why does uh why that happens from my perspective I think especially after the sixties mm-hmm. um, anthropologists were just struck with. Uh, uh, I don't know, but self uh, or like a, a guilt or a self uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, flagellation of, mm-hmm. of themselves uh, uh, on trying to spurge anything that would remotely look like uh, w- that we are not being subjective enough on explaining culture mm-hmm. um, f- from my perspective. And so, so for me, it seems that um, I- if we look at a, at the evolutionary psychology from that perspective, well, it, there is there is still a, a big leap until there, mm-hmm. right? But uh, mm-hmm. I wonder why uh, anthropology took this road, anyways. Like uh, you know, um, I still I still I still am a big fan of of uh, Georg Simmel, Durkheim, mm-hmm. um, Marcel Mauss, uh, and others. So I I just wondering what's the thing going on. Uh huh. Uh, so so I so you basically you're wondering why the sociocultural anthropology took such a critical perspective, highly critical perspective on evolutionary psychology or on evolutionary thinking in social science in general. Yes. Yes, but but, but to the point of of spurging things that actually didn't even have a evolution, like a strong evolutionary claim, like functionalism. Yes. So uh, I will have to check that part of the historical development of anthropology, but fu- functionalism, structural, structural, structuralism, and how they fit into this whole discussion mm-hmm. with evolutionary thinking. But I think that such a very strong and I would say a very emotional response that comes from the side of anthropologists, so is mostly due to that claim that uh, anthropology is not a scientific discipline, even. So. One also important aspect in the whole debate between uh, evolutionary psychology and sociocultural anthropology is also the claim about what makes uh, a discipline uh, a scientific discipline. 
So, uh, and that's also connected to the discussions that were happening in philosophy of science. So philosophy of science was there to discuss uh, scientific method. Mm -hmm. So scientific method basically means that if you use scientific method, that the knowledge you provide is scientific knowledge. So <laughs> this is really, really somewhat trivial, I know. So, and then the claim, so the divide between the natural sciences and the social sciences, humanities, was present during the 90, 90s, uh, when this whole uh, discussion between evolutionary psychology and anthropology was present. So mm. you basically, mm. I think you have Clifford Yertz who argues, I think that anthropology is not a scientific discipline because it deals with interpretations and interpretations are not different distinct and causal explanations and causal uh, explanations are the thing that science is producing. So he argued, I think uh, if I'm not being mistaken, so an anthropologist argued that anthropology is not a scientific discipline because it does not operate with the things philosophers of science argues are the things that make a scientific dis that make a discipline a scientific discipline. So basically, that's also one of the aspects of this whole debate. So uh, evolutionary psychologists had like a stronger claim on uh, their discipline being a scientific one and then anthropology not being sufficiently scientific. So, and then you have also this, this like a uh, problematic perspective uh, in in their Stention. like conversation, this tension, yes, another tension. And that's also connected to science force, for example, which is like, a, again, connected to uh, feminist philosophy of science, which is like trying to somehow provide like a build a bridge between uh, different views on scientific method, I would say, mm -hmm. and what makes uh, a discipline, a scientific discipline and so on. So I'm not sure you're interested in that. So I didn't really uh, answer your question, but mostly because I'm not sure that I have an answer to it. Mm -hmm. I will have to see like the more into 20th century development of anthropology to understand. Uh, yeah, so I'm not sure that to argue that Maybe there were some naturalistic approaches to anthropology, mm -hmm. but may, they didn't probably include evolutionary thinking mm -hmm. because evolutionary thinking, I can't think, comes with more assumptions than just trying to provide like a causal explanation no, of I culture. I agree with you. I agree with you. I think it was the, the functionalist yeah. idea was more naturalistic yeah. on, on the idea, yeah. well, we need social cohesion. We, yeah. So those institutions provide those things that yes. society need. Uh, and we should look at those, uh, mm -hmm. how, how, what are the components of those structures or, or, or of those, mm -hmm. um, of those institutions, uh, f from, from a naturalist perspective of exactly. what they are doing actually. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, with a, with a complete, uh, uh, cultural subjectivism that's, that's not possible anymore. Yes. And uh, that's, that's what, uh, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, you mentioned Gertz and I think, uh, even Gertz were still doing it on the on mm. after the mm -hmm. 60s uh, revolution. Um, but I'm not going to monopolize uh, the talk. No, yeah, I, I guess uh, for me, it's more of what makes a scientific discipline, uh, which ends up being quite interesting, um, whether there is a, a question to explore there. And I, I think probably a lot of people don't quite, they, they've heard hard sciences and soft sciences, but don't mm -hmm. quite get the distinction. And I think uh, one of the ways I think about it is uh, just along two dimensions. One mm -hmm. dimension is whether you're using more qualitative or quantitative mm -hmm. uh, data. And the other is uh, how much, to, to what extent you can mitigate the impact of the variables uh, which might uh, externally impact your the variable of interest or the unit of interest. I see. So mm -hmm. th th I don't know if uh, if you would agree with that. I think that as we, uh, if you build this sort of two dimensional spectrum, mm -hmm. then you can plot the differences between most fields, and maybe what makes something a field a field is that it it actually identifies um, a particular phenomenon, which is both the thing that is the explanatory mechanism, but also the thing that you're trying to explain. Mm -hmm. uh, so as as cognitive scientists our explanatory mechanism is cognition, but of course we're studying cognition itself. So we're trying to see what it actually impacts. I think culture is probably the same. Um, and when you're doing something like biology, you end up again dealing with the same uh, set of things where you're studying the things which you're, you are positing are the explanatory mechanisms themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there was a, the, 
maybe we can turn the the chapter more from the philosophy of science to more uh, about human nature itself mm -hmm. and what the essentialist uh, arguments are, mm -hmm. particularly as they pertain to gender. Uh -huh. Okay, so I'll like a, just a quick comment please, please, please. on the the divide between the hard sciences and the soft sciences. So yes, I think uh, probably at the core of this uh, like a distinction or divide again uh, is uh, it has to do with the quantitative qualitative divide. So you're using qualitative methods; they're maybe not always reliable that much. You're not able to like uh, repeat the uh, observations or the ex re replication of the echo. Yes, like yeah, you are better with that language. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but I think that also one of the things that how, maybe maybe that's not always explicit, but I think maybe in the lay understanding of the issues. So I think that people have a problem, lay people, I would say, and maybe also scientists, I don't know, uh, have a problem with the fact that social science uh, deals with things that we have an interest in, a very explicit interest in. So we are dealing with the problems that we would like them, we, we would like to resolve these problems. And we are explaining things that we have an interest for them to be explained. And, and also in particular ways, for example. So as a feminist, you would like to approach the case of divorce from a very, you're approaching this case from a very particular perspective. You have certain feminist assumptions and values, and you would like certain things to be the case. And then that's the issue of objectivity uh, coming in. So can you do science as a feminist? And can you produce feminist science? Is that an oxymoron? Can that happen? And then the problem with the social science is that, uh, and that's also something with qualitative methodology where also you as a researcher um, put yourself into research and that's that claim about reflexivity then it again comes from anthropology where in order to when you're presenting your data you have to be very reflexive about the ways how you collected this data and how you're interp interpreting them because this data is much more fragile than the numbers for example since they're collected through qualitative methods and then i think the divide between the hard sciences and the soft sciences basically is that that hard sciences are more objective because this subjective uh, subjective factor, which is the researcher and his or her interests, is not present in the methods and hard science research, mm -hmm. which I think is not the case. Uh, so from that perspective, I think the divide between the social sciences and the hard uh, and the natural sciences or soft or hard does not stand. I think bo both are equally influenced by these subjective preferences, idios idios increases and so on and so forth. And therefore, I think that if, and in explaining, for example, gender differences, you rely more on biology and you argue where biology is the hard science and biology cannot be influenced by feminist views and methods because it relies on scientific method and uses methods and methodologies and techniques that are not prone to being distorted by subjective preferences. Therefore, I, I'm, I like these biological explanations more because they are more scientific, more objective, more reliable, more credible. And on the other side, and I think that's not the case, that biologically can also be absolutely disto distorted by our values. And I will just give you one example, so, <laughs> which I think is, again, connects to evolutionary thinking. So there is like a big debate uh, in Serbia happening currently and also in the past couple of years about this gender issue. So we have a, like a very big raise of TERF, trans-exclusionary radical feminists, or basically argues that gender as a social category does not exist. It should be reduced to sex as to natural category and that we need to explain gender differences by using biological uh, explanations and so on and so forth. So that's a very conservative uh, feminist activist group. And then there is a, at the Faculty of Philosophy last year, I think, there was like a panel organized by the Department of Psychology uh, and there was like a debate on the... Uh, these gender differences and like a political debate about many things. And there was one guy, a biologist, who's like a older guy and he's a big name in Serbia in these biology, biology circles. And uh, another biologist who is more on the side of the feminist, she said, well, by evolutionary theory says that there is variation. <laughs> 
And he said, well, we should not, uh, ho- ho- what is the word in English? Um, we should not over uh, impose this variation when we are thinking about our social world. So there is not that much variation around us. So basically, he com- and the claim, uh, evolutionary claim, is that variation is all there is. Mm-hmm. And that's also the claim against the essentialism about the human nature. So you have like a evolutionary biologist who is a teacher, a professor at the faculty of biology. He's also in these like big uh, biology circles, these like, uh, how do you call them? Uh, boards where you decide about certain issues. And then the guy who is basically completely distorting what evolutionary theory uh, takes for granted. Mm-hmm. That variation is all there is. The variation is at the core of natural selection. Without variation, natural selection would not occur. And then you have a guy who is claiming, well, we should not, you know, uh, I, I, I'm lacking a word in English because I tried to translate it from Serbian, but... Overestimate the impact of. Yes, right. overestimate. So it's not the case that we have so much variation in the natural and social world, mm-hmm. which is basically, you know, a complete a misinterpretation of, of science and from the side of biology. So that's like a, my view on hard, soft science divide. So f- biology is not hard science. It's not harder than the mm-hmm. anthropology or social science, even though it maybe deals more, with more like uh, sophisticated methods and I don't know, theories and so on. So, yeah. and you ask then about mm-hmm. essentialism of, of human no, nature. I, so. I, I love what you, I love what you just said, because I think that the, a much better way to think about differences in sciences is just descriptions of methods mm-hmm. uh, and not thinking about one as superior to the other. Mm-hmm. Because I, like you said, I think one of the, in, this is a perfect example of also how eugenicists who were mm-hmm. evolutionary uh, biologists were ignoring tenets of, of their own work to push for something like eugenics, exactly. uh, which is I mean, exceptional. The fact that there can be so much cognitive bias. Mm-hmm. And I guess because uh one one of the one of the most important things from uh, on my end of, of what you of what you pointed out is that there's no way to do unbiased science exactly everybody has a subjective opinion and maybe exactly. the only true scientists in that in the sense of the old guard what the, what the sort of conservatives think science is is a child because they're the only ones not advancing an agenda as they explore everybody from the moment that they pick up a discipline attaches themselves to theories and is working towards a theory and either that theory is, uh, rightly so, a feminist theory, or that theory is, uh, I'm right about this this chemical <laughs> mechanism. You know, and it's it's kind of uh, the biases bleed through regardless. Exactly, that's a very feminist claim. So right. we have this claim thanks to feminist philosophy of science and uh, so uh, feminist epistemology, in fact, and standpoint theory and all this development in, in philosophy of science where they bas- basically argued exactly for that, that all science is value laden. And the question is, what should we do with that? Should we try to exclude these values because they are uh, distorting scientific objectivity or we need these values? And we have to just see how we should use them in order to, in the end, provide scientific knowledge. So that's like a huge topic. I really love that topic. That's like something that I read the most. So, and I wanted to say, uh, yes, so basically that's the that's the feminist claim. And they also argued uh, for another thing. They said, if you're arguing that your perspective is uh, value-free, you're basically being really uh, non-transparent, about uh, you're you're not pu- you're not putting your you're not providing you're not discussing your values in your uh, which are at the background of your research so you're pro- uh, you're uh, presenting your view as value free even though there is some ideology behind that's governing your scientific research and then the interpretation of your scientific data and that's usually so that's the whole feminist critique also of human nature so Basically, uh, you're, uh-huh. if, if you're, you like to- yeah, yeah, just to, just to rephrase, if you're not mm-hmm. making your biases explicit. Exactly. Okay, okay, gotcha, cool. Exactly. If you're not making your biases explicit, uh, you're just lying to, maybe you're not doing that intentionally. You're just lying to yourself that you're being objective. There are some biases uh, because you're a human being and you have certain agendas. Maybe they are, these are not like a politi- commitment to any political ideologies. Maybe that's only a commitment to your team 
your research team and you really would like to support this hypothesis and then while you do your science, while you're, you, you're collecting your observation, you really would like that to be the case. And then you're completely ignoring the data that proves the other, uh, the, the other thing. So it's not necessarily like a political and ideological commitment, something malicious in the background. It's just, you're, you're a human being. So basically the claim is that, and some ph feminist philosophers of science, they also assume that sometimes there are malicious uh, things in the background. And so basically they argue that if you're arguing that your uh, theory or science is value free, you are not being completely honest. And usually what's in the background are certain conservative values that uh, with the science that you offer, this science not really justifies because that, that would be like a naturalistic fallacy, but informs these values. And in the end, the argument is, well, like the present order of things is the uh, like the consequence of our biology, for example, if you're discussing human nature, therefore the things cannot be changed. But the biology in question, as someone would like to argue, is value free, hard science. Therefore, like that, that's what science tells us, even though uh, you, you definitely have some values which are in the background, but are not being transparent enough. And therefore, you cannot criticize them. So like, that's the, that's the whole point that feminists have a problem with science in general. However, uh, they, uh, they are not, uh, feminists are not um, disregarding science. That's quite the contrary. They, they need science. In fact, in their like feminist, um, how would I say, feminist struggles for a just and equal society. And what they do uh, as philosophers of science, they try to develop different views on scientific method and different views on scientific objectivity. So if previously scientific objectivity was understood as a value freedom, so freedom from any values or, or as objectivity as disinterestedness that you do not have any interest when you're doing science. So that's a, like a big um, Max Weber's argument that when you like uh, as a person, you have certain values, but when you enter a room where you're doing your science, you leave your all values behind and then you will become a scientist who is completely disinterested. So yes, so so that's what basically feminists argue uh, that uh, they try to provide different views on scientific objectivity. They have different ideas about it, but the core point is that we need our values in scientific research from ad because we have like different theoretical problems. I don't know, do I have to go into details with that? But we need val values in our research every time when we are faced with certain scientific choices, which are not uh, governed by the evidence. They're subdetermined by data. So basically, we have to make these choices uh, on another basis. And these bases are usually our values. And then, so we need them in order to proceed with our scientific uh, research. But uh, in order to reach scientific objectivity, these values have to always be transparent and they also have to be uh, criticized. And uh, and th this is the argument that Helen Longino made. She's a philosopher of science, also a feminist. She argues that scientific objectivity is not a trait of an individual researcher or a, of a scientific method, but a trait of scientific organization. Mm -hmm. And then you, you need to have a different um, mechanism instituted which will allow uh, your views to be uh, uh, able to criticize, uh, open to criticism, like conferences, peer review, and discussions that you have, and so on and so forth. So I will stop now. So no, I, I, I love that. I, I think that's exactly it, is that human beings are incapable of being objective. It's sort of a nonsensical thing. You mm -hmm. exist through the world, mm -hmm. through your identity. And what the best that we can do is try to build a system which strives towards something like being objective. Exactly. And the only way to do that is build better systems. That's kind of the core of, of some of my philosophy of science work, which is trying actually to axiomatize things uh -huh. explicitly for the reason of making things um, explicit so that criticisms can be lodged in the right direction. Uh -huh. And uh, to me, like I take the like a Lakatoshian framework try to uh, axiomatize both core values and then auxiliary assumptions. Oh, nice. And that way you can say, oh, I, you know, I see this assumption that you're making 
in in one of your auxiliary assumptions that's impacting your core values, therefore. Nice. Um, but then also if somebody's missing that, if somebody is making claims which are inherently, uh, say, non-feminist, say, misogynist, mm -hmm. uh, essentialist about race, you mm -hmm. can say you're, miss you're missing a core axiom here. Exactly. And that has to be sort of implemented into the theory. Uh, you haven't read Helen Longino? Yes, I have read the Held Lunch. Because she, are, yeah, yeah, yeah. she uses this auxiliary uh, assumption. So is she, she calls them background assumptions. She calls them background assumptions. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you're familiar with that claim. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. that's also one of the ways how values enter your research because you have certain assumptions which are pretty theoretical and then they are also guiding your uh, scientific choices and you have to make them explicit in order to and open them to criticism. So yeah, nice. So you're ba basically trying to axiomatize all these things in order to direct criticism into certain directions. So yeah, it's uh, really interesting. Trying to trying to provide frameworks through which people can axiomatize easily. Ah. Yeah, and then hopefully just be constantly doing that in my work and then setting that as an example. Like one of the things we did was take an old theory of evolu of emotion, uh -huh. axiomatize that uh, and say, okay, these are the assumptions that are being made. These are the core values. This, these are the auxiliary points. And then we can critique everything. Extremely interesting. That's yeah, super fun. So we, maybe we could talk about that more later. Yes. <laughs> but one thing I really want to uh, touch on is more of uh, essentialist arguments about gender. Because mm -hmm. I think we touched about it um, in the periphery. We talked about it. Mm -hmm. But um, I, it would be great if you addressed it a bit more directly. Okay. Uh, so basically, essentialism, first of all, human nature means that all humans uh, share uh, all humans and only humans share certain characteristics, certain features, cert certain traits that makes them humans. So that's essentialism. And that's a very difficult claim to make because, you know, uh, you have so much diversity and variation that it's very difficult to make like a, a def uh, limited or defined set of these traits that every human being will possess and only human beings. So the problem with essentialism is that first it dehumanizes uh, certain uh, members of the human species which do not possess the traits that, that are in this set. And it's also not consistent with Darwinian ontology because you need variation in order to have natural selection. So you, you can, if you look only at the genes, you will not find anything that is universal, meaning all and only pres present in all uh, members of the human species and only in them. And uh, the second thing that's a problem with uh, this essentialist views on human nature is that you have a very strong influence of culture. So, uh, and basically, I, I try to remember now like the historical uh, development of this essentialist views on human nature, but uh, yeah. So basically, that, that, that's, the, that's the whole point. You, you know, the essentialism means that you have something that is an essence, uh, and this essence then defines what it means to be a human being. And uh, this whole idea of having an essence that defines a human species is, take, uh, is similar to this essentialist thinking in chemistry, for example. We have like a, a gold, which is an atomic element, and then you have like a, an atomic number. And this, if you find something in the nature that has the same atomic number, then you know that the thing you have found is gold. So that's basically the essentialist thinking in chemistry. And then you can use this type of thinking in order to think about different chemical kinds. And then the same type of thinking was used in, in, in biology to define uh, species. And then the, these problems like Darwinian ontology, the causal influence of culture, and the fact that uh, if you try to define this essence, there will always be certain members of human species which are, are uh, definitely the members of human species which are going to be excluded from this, from this uh, like a weirdly defined set. And then also, how do you define what are the traits that are part of essence? That's always the decision of someone who has the power to define them. So that's, that's the whole problem with the essentialism about human nature. And then when you have uh, the gender thing uh, in the question. So, uh, yeah, so basically, uh, I think that uh, like this evolutionary thinking that's characteristic for evolutionary psychology always somehow leads to essentialism. Because if you argue that 
the differences between men and women are due to their biological differences, biological endowment, then these uh, differences become essentialized. If they are part of our nature, and this evolved nature, which basically means that it's universal, because if a trait is evolved, biologically evolved, then it's universal. That's characteristic for the all members of the human species. So if that's the case, then these gender differences, which are then explained in terms of evolved cognitive mechanism in the case of evolutionary psychology, become essentialized. So that's how I understand this connection between essentialism about human nature, essentialism about the gender, well, the biological explanations of that gender differences, and why through trying to explain gender differences by way of evolutionary thinking, these gender differences become essentialized. Yeah, it I, makes sense. Definitely, definitely. And one of the sort of as a as a background um, for listeners, uh, mm -hmm. not <laughs> for you, uh, is that th a lot of the arguments about the the nature of man was specifically about the nature of men, even more specifically about the nature of white men in Western Europe. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of the arguments they were making about the psychology of mankind, which mm -hmm. are essential, are, were really cultural elements that they were assuming were natural to the human species, exactly. which were just to them, the, their little subgroup of actually even affluent white male Western Europeans. Uh, so then, because you, you raise the point that feminists raise a lot, is that this then is dehumanizing because then there are individuals who are human <laughs> who don't share these traits that these wealthy white Western European men in the you know 19th century had. Mm -hmm. So then the, arg the argument is how do we understand... Um, human nature or is that even I, I guess my question for you is is that even a a useful theoretical term to be dealing with that's 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 a very good question so yes basically you really nicely explained the whole issue behind the, the feminist critique of human nature and i think that's again connected to this whole sociobiology evolutionary psychology thing uh because yes so you you take a set of social behaviors like the monogamous heterosexual marriage, for example, and you see that that's the the majority of people within your within your culture are uh, conforming to these practices, and then you assume that since most of the people uh, do this, and also y the the person who tries to explain human nature and who wants to argue something about human nature is usually conforming to these practices. These are his practices. Ar argues that they are universal. They should be universal because they are part of human nature. If there are cases of uh, men or women who do not conform to these social practices we are claiming that are universal, then there is a problem with them because they do not, they are not fully human. So yes, yeah, so that's basically the, the whole uh, issue behind uh, this, like this evolutionary approach to human nature, arguing that yeah, you start from certain social practices and then assume that they can be explained by reference to biology, to nature, to genes, and then since uh, they are part of biology, nature, and genes that have evolved to solve certain social problems, they have to be universal, and essentialized. Essentialism comes into the picture. So yes, that's basically that. And sorry, you asked, uh, what was your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, is human nature then even a... Uh, yes, yeah. a useful, useful theoretical term. So mm -hmm. basically, uh, so there are different like uh, feminist perspectives on the issue. There are people who are arguing that this concept or the term should be completely eliminated, mostly because of this like a dehumanizing perspective. And you have like a huge normative burden on this concept because everyone is using this term, not only in scientific disciplines, but also lay people uh, in everyday conversations. So we rely on this term a lot and we usually use it in order to exclude someone from our group. Mm -hmm. And so you have a, a extreme uh, a normative burden on this on this term. So there are people who are arguing that it should it needs to be eliminated from the everyday and scientific use and can be, for example, uh, exchanged with other terms like human condition, let's say, or something like that. And then also you have uh, uh, other side of feminists who argue that we still need the term 
because we need it in order to argue how women have been oppressed uh, through the history because of the certain claims about human nature. So you, you have, we need to preserve the term in order to show how this whole idea was used uh, historically through history uh, in uh, to, 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 to support uh, female oppression. So basically these are like the two competing positions. So are they even are they even competing or is one saying are do both agree that we sh we ought not use it going forward but that one group is saying but we need to have one area dedicated to looking at how it's been harmful uh well so i think that some explicitly argue that we should eliminate the term mm -hmm. fully even though the concept of human nature can stay but the term we are just replacing the term with another term even though we need the concept in order to integrate the sciences in fact so we need to na the thing that we are uh, trying to explain or describe uh, we need the term to show that we are dealing with the uh, same thing like for example human condition we, of course, have to be very specific about our, our, our perspective and epistemic goals to see whether we are dealing with the same thing. Because when you're doing uh, approaching human nature as a, as your thing to be explained, you can do that from many different perspectives. So you have the, the, so many disciplines and sciences and theories and so on and so forth. So and the other side is arguing that we still need the term human nature as well. So... Uh, and basically, this term, again, uh, had a very positive connotation. So Darwin was also an anti-racist. And this whole idea about uh, universal human nature that is shared by all members of the human species was there to uh, justify anti-racist or to support, maybe it's better to say like that, to support anti-racist policies and abolitionism as well. So then... The claim that we are all humans, that we are all sharing the human nature, implies that we have all an equal share in human rights. So that's also one of the ways why feminists would like to preserve the term human nature, because it also has a very positive political connotation, even though in different contexts it can be used for dehumanization, for another completely different political purpose. And then I was reading recently a book uh, on Judith Butler, so not it's not written by Butler, so I still haven't uh, tried to read her, but a uh, book where Judith Butler is basically, so she comes from this, like this very post-modernist tradition and post-modernist, they try to somehow completely argue against the, like the scientific hegemony, I would say, and they try to deconstruct everything that sci science took for granted. So like uh, post-modernism is really a social constructivist endeavor, basically deconstructing the categories for which we thought were natural kinds, like gender, for example, showing that, well, gender is not a natural kind, so it's something that is different from sex, for example, and gender is a social category which is formed thanks to different uh, social influences, so social norms, and so on and so forth. So even though Judith Butler, for example, comes from this like very postmodernist perspective, she still believes that we ha need to have some notion of humanity, some humanist perspective. And postmodernism was against humanism. So we still need some humanist perspective. However, this perspective needs to be contested all the time. Because we need to uh, be very fluid about our uh, like uh, boundaries of humanity. Because when people recognize that they are being excluded from this humanity, that these those who are in power define what is humanity, we have to open the perspective. We have to like include those who, who are now claiming that they also have the equal share in human rights. So it's like a very interesting perspective on Judith Butler. And it's also very interesting how Judith Butler enters uh, the picture that is mostly framed in very ana heavy analytic language by philosophers of science like Helen Longin and maybe Ian Hacking, for example. And Judith Butler him from a, he comes from a completely different tradition, but basically speaking about very similar things. Yeah, it, it's so interesting how I think one of the most dangerous uses of human nature is when we justify things like violence. Uh, that we always need to be militarist because there's going to be somebody else who's militarist. So we have mm -hmm. these interesting ways where uh, the term human nature is both used to 
uh, exclude individuals, mm-hmm. but then also to justify behavior exactly. which are against other humans. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I like the last uh, also things of, uh, that you said, particularly about uh, Judith Butler's argument, because I think that, I guess maybe this is just my analytic perspective in general, but I think that we ought to always build descriptive accounts. That mm-hmm. are epistemic rather than ontological. This mm-hmm. is sort of like my, and I think that 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 works really well for for a lot of uh, feminist critiques of mm-hmm. of science, especially things like human nature, because it's then inclusive. If somebody mm-hmm. pops up, then you have to include them in the description of the thing that you're claiming to describe, mm-hmm. uh, rather than building an essentialist uh, argument, which then you try to ad hoc add in. Uh-huh. You just say my definition is my description of the thing. Exactly. Yeah, uh, that's also very interesting because uh, most of the things that I know about human nature I uh, learned here at CU uh, in the previous couple of years. And uh, my professor from the philosophy department here, Maria Kronfeldner, she has a book on, it's called What's Left uh, of Human Nature, where she basically argues that uh, human nature is an essentially contested concept and also a as a, a pluralist concept, and then you have different kinds of human nature which have survived the uh, uh, the uh, criticism of essentialist human nature. And she argues that you have a descriptive human nature where you just pick the traits that are typical and stable for the human species. However, they are always also very uh, specific to your epistemic aims and goals. So the human nature that a cognitive scientist will pick is not the same as the descriptive human nature that a cognitive scientist will pick is not the same as the human nature that a sociocultural anthropologist would pick. And she argues that there is a descriptive human nature, explanatory human nature, which refers to uh, uh, things uh, that are part of uh, biologically inherited traits, which are then causes of certain behaviors so like that's the, the explanatory human nature is the na- human nature that explains the things that we would like to investigate. And then you have the last one is classificatory human nature. So how, what are the traits that classify us uh, as the members of the human species? And she argues that all these human natures are in fact also how you will approach these perspectives that depends on your disciplinary interests. So what is explanatory for me would not be explanatory for you. And in that way, she tries to somehow overcome all the all the criticism that was put forward to essential, uh, essentialist human nature, like, you know, the in- nature-culture interaction, Darwinian ontology, dehumanization as well, and so on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you're interested. I yeah, definitely. We'll have to chat with her later as well. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I was just thinking um, how, how, for me, it seems that it's easy to get the concept of human nature polluted by the common sense of what it is, mm-hmm. right? So how we use it. Like how the colloquial use. The colloquial use. Right. Yeah. Uh, and as you said, it's, it's, it's just not compatible with uh, Darwinian ontology. So we have to have variation, otherwise mm-hmm. we don't have selection of, uh, of traits. Uh, but, f- well, f- from my perspective, which uh, I'm pretty much um, um, evolutionary, mm-hmm is that uh, there is almost no space for essentialism within evolutionary thinking because what we are looking at when we are describing a trait is basically that there is a range mm-hmm. on which certain trait can be expressed mm-hmm. in different ways. So there will be diversity mm-hmm. within the expression of some, of mm-hmm. some kind of trait. So, um, and when we are saying, when we are for what you both described essentialism is just that uh, there will be not flexibility on the on the on the expression of those traits they are certain like they are yeah. what they are yes, and if they, they are not mm-hmm. you're not belong to the category exactly that, so and, and i think that's a counterintuitive from an evolutionary perspective on which on which traits have to vary on w- how they expressed mm-hmm. in relation to the environment on exactly. which they are uh, and that's the the, the extended uh, uh, evolutionary thesis, uh, uh, modern mm-hmm. thesis. Mm-hmm. That uh, if if the environment doesn't doesn't allow you to express this trait in this way, you can express it in another way. So it, it's just it's conflicting for me, um, and I don't think I think I think it's it's complicated for me to get there to okay like 
if you're talking about essentialism, I am with mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. But if you're talking about natural selection of traits, mm-hmm. I can see within an extended modern thesis mm-hmm. that, uh, that there is variation and expression of those traits, and you can still loosely put boundaries, as Darby put put, put mm-hmm. boundaries, even even in in speci- speciation. There, are like mm-hmm. sometimes there is hard bo- boundaries. Is a mule. Uh, a species or mm-hmm. what it is so mm-hmm. th- there is but you kind of like push, put loose boundaries and you allow the boundaries to be pushed here or there okay. so for me it, it, I would reconcile in that way just just to, to, to put some words on the essentialist uh, okay. perspective uh, but I, I so I was just wondering uh, also and th- that's more like a question to you why isn't there uh, um, um, a feminist um production of evolutionary psychology so why this so you mentioned there are different approaches uh, f- from fem- uh, of feminist philosophy on evolutionary psychology or mm-hmm. you didn't say that you said that uh, on essentialism or mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but uh, and you mentioned two of them mm-hmm. and you kind of touched upon uh, uh, on the use or the preserve on the preservation of the term uh, human nature and what we were talking about before is that uh, researchers, scientists always put their own agenda uh-huh. behind uh-huh. voluntarily or, or, or voluntarily they always put their agenda. And wouldn't that be, be beneficial to have the agenda of feminism producing evolutionary psychology? Evolutionary psychology. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, uh, so... Why first, is it the manosphere? First, a comment on this uh, extended uh, evolutionary modern thesis. Yeah. Modern thesis. So, basically, the problem with evolution. So, w- this is also the criticism that comes from evolutionary, uh, from philosophy of science. So, the claim is that so even though uh, evolutionary thinking allows uh, diversity and variation in the expression of genes. Nevertheless, and then evolutionary psychology, because I think that we haven't really explained a lot what evolu- precisely now what evolutionary psychology claims. So please, uh, if I'm making a mistake, you will you will correct me. So basically, evolutionary psychology assume and argue that uh, certain social behaviors exist because they are the expression of uh, they exist due to certain cognitive modules which are evolved and adaptive, and they evolve uh, during the time of the Pleistocene, because that was the time in the human history, the longest period in the human history, which allows the evolution to occur, because evolution takes time. So uh, the, these cognitive modules evolved as a response to the environmental, environmental pressures that were present during the Pleistocene. So basically the claim is that uh, these social behaviors that are the consequence of cognitive modules are the optimal behaviors for the environment that was present in the Pleistocene. So if then you assume that monogamous heterosexual union between men and women is the consequence of the evolved cognitive mechanisms and therefore adaptations to certain environmental pl- pressures, then this type of social practice is an optimal type of behavior because it allows you to solve the problems that you're being pressured by the environment. You, you, you could have like, I, so, well, that's, I'm not gonna... so that's the criticism that's put forward mm-hmm. by philosophers of science. And I, so one of my tasks in my PhD, in my doctoral research, is to really do this internalist analysis. So as a philosopher of science, to do this internalist analysis and to see whether philosophers of science are really... Uh, criticizing the strongest claims that evolutionary psychology put forward and to see whether this the most contemporary evolutionary psychology which doesn't really look like a social bio- so- soci- sociobiology anymore whether they have these assumptions that uh, philosophers of science like to criticize so that's like the part of this internalist analysis and you know I'm, I'm, I, I have a really like a object <laughs> now ob- ob- objectivity again so my interest in this doctoral uh, research is to provide the strongest interpretation of contemporary evolutionary psychology before i uh, 
contrast this the strongest interpretation with the uh, criticism that is present however as a feminist i hope i also will put a very strong pressure on evolutionary psychology to show that they are being uh, how to say benevolent uh, in their scientific practices so basically i would like to investigate whether they try to overcome the division between anthropology and evolutionary psychology because the this intention will show me that they are willing to uh, answer these critiques of genetic reductionism determinism critiques that are also very very politically important from a, especially feminist perspective so even though i would like to like uh, allow evolutionary psychologists to explain themselves to give them the voice but however i will put them to the test a very harsh test so these are like my interests uh and my my uh and the question that you asked is completely why different. isn't there a feminist evolutionary yes, psychology feminist evolutionary psychology so that's uh for me a completely unexplored field and uh to be honest i just completely uh took for, for granted that there, that there is no such thing and then i wrote a paper and i received uh, a com- comments from a, one of the reviewers telling me well why are you not mentioning feminist uh, evolutionary psychology and i was like really? that's all, that also exists. makes sense that's- yeah so and then i realized that there is like a one uh, person and i will not mention now because i hope that she will she will uh, re- reply to my email when i ask her to be my interviewee so she's an evolutionary psychologist but i think that she also tries to somehow provide like a feminist perspective on the issue all of there is also, uh, all, all, of course, Sarah Hardy. She's a sociobiologist and a feminist. Mm-hmm. But I know that also some feminist philosophers of science criticize her as not really being feminist. So I will, I will have to like investigate this whole uh, unexplored field. I should have phrased my question as why isn't there if there isn't, right? Yeah. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I just just to touch upon, well, I, I, I need to know. Mm-hmm. everything that you know about <laughs> the feminist evolutionary psychology because i think you 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 put a you put it like very well and i uh, when you say what is mainstream evolutionary psychology mm-hmm. what's mo- mostly what mm-hmm. it is right so i think your description is it's mm-hmm. it's it's perfect it is what you what you describe mm-hmm. it is um i think i am a little bit more Uh, c- coming from from an evolutionary perspective, I and also from anthropology, mm. <laughs> like I'm a bachelor's, I think I I am more on a kind of a, another kind of a team or like a group that uh, trying to push the critic to evolutionary psychology from mm-hmm. an evolutionary perspective. Ah, uh, I see. Yes. So pointing yeah. out on how evolutionary psychology does not follow evolutionary principles mm-hmm. um, by extending the thesis to um, mm-hmm. d- in many different ways. Mm-hmm. So I am coming, I, I'm also doing the critic from a, from a different perspective. So that's exactly. why I commented on that before. But I think your description is, uh, is yeah. pretty much what it is on, on, the, on the zeitgeist, on the... On the yeah, exactly. You know? And then just uh, lastly, because I think we are still uh, approaching the end. So uh, and this whole topic, uh, my research also tries to deal or provide an answer to this whole Jordan Peterson case. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's so what we have in mind, that's right? That's what we all have in mind. So that's, you know. Yeah. And I would also like to defend evolutionary psychology. So there are a lot of people who are doing this who are you know, who are not uh, Jordan Peterson followers, you know, mm-hmm. so I would like to defend the field yeah. in the yes, lay people's understanding of uh, what evolutionary psychology is claiming. So so I would like to defend the field. However, uh, with this feminist background, I will not allow, we, I will not defend it in case there is nothing to be defended. Mm-hmm. So that's basically. Uh, just a, a, a quick question, sorry. Please, <laughs> please. Like, Why, if uh, the behavior was uh, beneficial, like monogamy on the place to send, why should it be beneficial now? Uh, why, sh- wh- why is that beneficial, uh, like no. monogamy why, why now? Why does it still? Uh, no. well, yeah. well, like, uh, I don't, I don't because our genes determine what we are, and yeah. we have no choice. But like, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so say, like, uh, well, it was the, 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 the behavior that was selected because it was beneficial in that environment on the place mm-hmm. to send it, like, what? Why would it be why? beneficial today? Yeah. Well, uh, so just a, a case like Yeah, I think at the core of that argument is that uh women and men reproduce and then if you have children, 
it's easier to take care of them in nuclear families. But if you just completely disregard the, the, this assumption that we uh, want to reproduce all the time and that maybe there are people who do not want li- do not need children, then the monogamous uh, heterosexual union doesn't really... It's why, why, why do we need it? So I'm not sure. I think there is like a whole book, uh, How Minds Make Societies mm-hmm. by Pascal uh, Boyer. Mm-hmm. And he uh, discussed these issues. And that's also the book that I have to return to because I was reading it, I think, four years ago when I was doing my MA. And I was reading it not knowing that I will end up analyzing these claims. So I have to return to it, to be honest. And he has like a whole chapter on how this, like a, on the evolution of the monogamous heterosexual unions. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah, I have to return to that. But I think one of the core arguments that people would make is that the behavior is encoded in, in genetics. And mm-hmm. that, so this is just for... But that's the essentialist yeah, yeah. kind of person. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that en- ends up being a big thing of what people argue is that, oh, I'll, because our, because we had certain sets of behaviors, because we do observe that certain behaviors are reproduced in the animal kingdom, therefore all of our behaviors must be encoded in our genes. Since we are human and they were human, we must have the same behaviors. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I yeah, have yeah. to say so. Like, Not for you, that's for everybody. Yeah, 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 no, yeah, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Like, it, it just imagine, like, I, I, like you, get, you get a behavior mm-hmm. encoded in a gene. So the gene, to, to, for, for the gene to, 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 for the gene to, to change, mm-hmm. to be selected, it, 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 it it ha- to, to a random mutation to happen on mm-hmm. the species. Mm-hmm. It takes time to the random mutation to get the, the right mm-hmm. combination to supply some, some uh-huh. pressure in the mm-hmm. environment. But if the gene allows for a range of behaviors to be displayed, mm-hmm. to, be, to be expressed from, from that same encoding mm-hmm. that it has, you basically master the environment. Mm-hmm. Because it, if the environment changes a little bit of... Or, like. Like if if you if your body mm-hmm. has a gene mm-hmm. that was encoded for you to survive at twenty five degrees mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and only twenty five degrees, mm-hmm. if if the the temperature goes one up, mm-hmm. the entire population is vanished. Mm-hmm. But if your body can survive from minus sixty to mm-hmm. forty, mm-hmm. then you can then you can thrive. So so that it's it, this this idea of like the gene, a behavior, it's just a yeah, it's I mean, a little bit of how it's 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 hard for me. <laughs> it, it for me uh, gets yeah. I'm uh, mostly very confused. <laughs> Most of the time, I'm very confused by all this like uh, genes, and then you have like uh, this whole idea of selfish genes, highly criticized. Then you have uh, Pinker's book on the blank slate, and there's, there's, uh, like uh, a lot of discussion is happening on all of these issues, and. You can just have like a very fragmented and very limited knowledge on all this. You really have to go deeply into the claims in order to see whether the criticism that you're hearing all the time or the claims supporting or the like, uh, you know, popular claims that are supported by this evolutionary thinking, how do they all come together? It's a very confusing thing. And another <laughs> thing that adds to that confusion is epigenetics. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you know, yeah, it's like you have. Cons- <laughs> yeah, it yeah. adds a lot for the confusion. <laughs> no, yeah, definitely. it adds a lot to the confusion. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, one of the. I, I guess, yeah, to your point, we have to make sure we're not dismantling straw men. Yeah, Stra- exactly. um, and that we're, our critiques are actually lodged at the right places, the mm-hmm. valid criticisms of the, um, of the things we're criticizing. But, yeah, I think one of the, uh, one of the important things is the amount of variability that we get uh, from just species in general, when we try to define what makes humans so different, to me, one of humanity's most remarkable consistent trait is adaptability. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be, while uh, biological life is uh, tends towards adaptability because of, like Guilherme said, you need to be able to survive in in certain environments, otherwise your your population might collapse. Uh, And in some sense, this is what causes speciation in general, is humans have... uh, I mean, we haven't existed for very long, mm-hmm. but something that is proving to be our one of our defining traits because of how much we've expanded the population is just our sheer ability to adapt. Mm-hmm. And it seems like if if we understand cognition in any way that deviates from just that which allows us to adapt more effectively, mm-hmm. then we're kind of missing the point. Because mm-hmm. I think that this is something really crucial. And instead of highlighting this really crucial point, which is the adaptive uh, 
say, function of mm-hmm. cognition and instead encoding behaviors mm-hmm. uh, to explain certain aspects of cognition, which we subdivide into modules because somehow it mm-hmm. makes it convenient, th- then we that allows us to build some kind of um, cognitive uh, evolutionary psychology as it exists today, but doesn't mm-hmm. really exist in a way that's flexible enough to take us into a future mm-hmm. post-critique. Mm-hmm. I'm also not entirely sold on the uh, encapsulate modularity. Of yeah, the mind. yeah, yeah. I'm not, but I, I think it's a little bit, like, I think your whole cognitive uh, architecture, architecture uh, structure, like uh-huh. everything that you architecture. have. Architecture. Architecture. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I always, yeah. Uh, it, 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 it is part of the environment on which a module has to operate. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a module cannot be a, cannot only be in interaction with the external environment without being in interaction with the other modules that you already have. Mm-hmm. So it's it can it can only be selected within the whole mm-hmm. thing. So mm-hmm. the selection of modularity I, it's something that is is hard to sell to me. Yeah. So yeah, I, I I will definitely after the podcast I will take the notes about the things that you said. So. <laughs> the, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That, I think just one last thing because we we can chat mm-hmm. for a couple more minutes if we want is uh, just the idea of uh, being able to account for the environments uh, that systems are in and mm-hmm. uh, not taking approaches. And this kind of speaks to the integration project that you have, mm-hmm. not only dealing with the systems or the components mm-hmm. as uh, the sole uh entities that exist, but actually looking at the interaction between system and component. Mm -hmm. So being able to integrate the human in the society and the society as part of the human, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Mm -hmm. as opposed to just society and human. And this integration project would really help us to understand so much more of of what it is that's going on. Exactly. I have a question. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I I was just thinking, um, evolutionary psychology, or maybe not the process that's processor of, of mm-hmm. evolutionary psychology, maybe, well, the mostly social Darwinism kind of perspective, this uh, uh-huh. uh, different stages of development, so dwell on a, on, a, on a period on which people were looking for uh, mm-hmm. justifications for mm-hmm. their already mm-hmm. uh, placed, mm-hmm. but pre-established uh, power structures. Exactly. Very nicely framed. It <laughs> seems to me that evolutionary psychology or modern evolutionary psychology has been selling really well Jordan mm-hmm. Peterson, mm-hmm. for example, mm-hmm. because it's also attending mm-hmm. to something that some people want to hear. Exactly. Oh, yeah. right? Ab- absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's absolutely the case. So, I, yeah, I, I was I was going to ask you something related mm-hmm. to that, but uh, kind of like the question was the way that I phrased the answer already. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was the question, basically. Yes, do that, you think that do, do you think that's the reason? And yeah. if that's the reason, what should we do in relation to that? If because because uh, it's a, it's a, it's basically a mainstream science. Like we we have uh, people basically making a lot of money out of it exactly. because it's it sells. Yeah. I really appreciate the question. What should we do about it? Mm-hmm. And that's really a very important question. So. I I am doing my doctoral research and I, tr- I hope that I will be able to produce a written work where, where I will uh, investigate evolutionary psychology and try to show that, well, how Jordan Peterson is using it is a misinterpretation of the field. Or maybe it is not. If it's not a misinterpretation of the field, then the-, the field has the problem. Mm-hmm. And then what will all the people who are doing evolutionary psychology, how, so, you know, you, you, like a, a very well established field. And I think that's the field that gets a lot of money. So, and that gets back to like this, my whole scientometrics project. So my whole idea behind this conceptual integration is like, you're claiming that this is a symmetrical process. But if you, as an evolutionary psychology, uh, have more power also in the scientific arena and in the social arena, then you also have more freedom not to include different perspectives in your research. Mm-hmm. And this freedom comes uh, with more money, having more money. Mm-hmm. And you have more money, money, you have more funding because your research uh, is popular. So this is like the whole, like a very macro perspective on the thing. And I think I would like, uh, after my PhD, I would like to use scientometrics to explore this more further. So where the money goes Mm -hmm. and 
you know, so where the money are uh, people from uh, are anthropologists receiving uh, publicly or privately uh, funded money in order to do their research, which is very emancipatory, much more emancipatory than this like conservative evolutionary social science. So basically, that's that's the whole idea behind this conceptual integration. So it's a very political thing. Mm -hmm. You will integrate if you need to do so, Mm -hmm. you know, if, if you're pressured to do so. So maybe you will receive uh, more funding as an anthropologist if you have evolutionary psychologists That's in your really team. And maybe as an evolutionary psychologist, you do not need feminists and, and uh, anthropologists in your team in order to secure some funding. Mm-hmm. So that's basically like a... And then this funding is connected to, I think, this is uh, unexplored, this is like a mer- my very big assumption, connected to the power that your theory has in the public understanding. And public understanding is mostly uh, shaped by Jordan Peterson and his idea and his interpretation of evolutionary thinking. So I have no clue to be honest. It's like a, my whole big, uh, big picture, uh, big picture thing. I don't know. Yeah, this is a really important aspect of the philosophy of science. Is when we discuss science in the sort of public awareness, mm-hmm. colloquial term of science is the is this idealized act of science. Mm -hmm. completely divorced from the industry of science. Mm -hmm. So you have science as an institution, which is, say, the collected set of understandings. Mm -hmm. I I don't like the word facts, but just this collective Mm -hmm. set of understandings and interpretations. And then you have the the industry of science, which it is invariably wedded to. There's no way Mm -hmm. to divorce the two things. And the, the funny thing is, if you're trying to understand what science is and what science does, you need not just quantitative, but qualitative analyses to understand because there are policy measures and individual psychology measures. It, there are pressures to publish in certain ways, exactly. uh, which which then gear the science. And like you said, there is a lot of the game that's funding oriented and what might get funding is from people who are not scientists mm-hmm. and they're going to be funding what's sexy because they're consuming what's in popular culture exactly <laughs> so and <sighs> what about the people that still want to hear what they want to hear yeah. what who, who, i mean i think that's all of us <laughs> no yeah yeah no no yeah, I, mean, but, I, mean, so, I mean in terms of uh, that, that's like, human nature i mean i mean <laughs> yes i mean the the, the 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 group of buyers of uh, mm-hmm. of uh 21 lessons to whatever uh-huh you know? the <laughs> <laughs> uh, like Will these people find a new niche, a, a, a scientific niche that can ex- can can explain things as I, they want them to be explained man, to them? Then, then I think we're getting into more of like the extreme beliefs topic. Okay. Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. because then yeah, then education, makes I would say makes sense. Yeah, I I guess I've um, deviated a bit from I I used to put education tantamount. Mm-hmm. Uh, I used to think that it was the priority, and now I feel like the the affective component. Um, social mm-hmm. inclusion mm-hmm. Uh, is is really important only because uh-huh. you For get the formation of beliefs. That's mm-hmm. the one, mm-hmm. especially when you look at people who, I mean, the the type of person that's going to be feel validated by something uh, like a like a misogynist evolutionary psychology is somebody who's gonna who feels as though they are uh, society is shifting away from them, mm-hmm. even though that. Obviously, it's not the case. Mm-hmm. Uh, we exist in a very firmly rooted patriarchal society, mm-hmm. but there are men who feel as though their power is being stripped away from them. And so some other <laughs> men come and sell them the, that exact idea. They feel validated by it. And if we, if we build systems um, around the idea of, of inclusivity that, uh, and sort of validation, Mm-hmm. then we might be able to mitigate the risks of, of charlatans, frauds, mm-hmm. uh, and people who are, I, I, don't, I don't even think that people like Jordan, I don't think that Jordan Peterson himself is a fraud or a charlatan. I think he's delusional. And so, you know, there, there <laughs> are really multiple. Think so? I, I think so. I think he believes what he sells, but that's, you know, it could go either way. I wouldn't die on that no, hill. I, I also, I also if think. He's, it's, it's not even yeah. important. It's, it's not, delusional. exactly, that's it's the thing. Like a, but it's just descriptive. Yeah. But then it's like, uh, there are, probably different approaches that are going to um, uh, work for different people. Mm-hmm. Like if somebody might be, if somebody is feeling validated by Jordan Peterson, then you might need something like uh, validation inclusivity uh, to, to 
provide them something that prov- that gives them value the same way Peterson gives them value. Mm-hmm. But if they if they're just misogynists that see it as an instrumental tool, mm-hmm. validation is not going to do that much. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. it's it's important in in the in just describing what's going on, we don't need to understand their internal states. Mm-hmm. But in terms of reconciling the problem, mm-hmm. we need to, to some degree, mitigate the kinds of reasons people have for uh, uh, treating this type of thing. That's very interesting. And that's also one of the things that we can do <laughs> exactly, about yeah. this whole issue, especially cognitive scientists, I, I guess. And uh, I guess we'll, we'll start wrapping up, but mm-hmm. maybe uh, what's one of the... If you could think of uh, a an idealized goal to achieve in your work or your field in, in the next few decades. You'd be like, I'd be really happy if if I got to this point of understanding or if the field shifted in this direction. What, what would that look like to you? Uh, so that's a very interesting question. I, I think I never thought about this. So what, how, what, what would, I don't know. So, let, let me think quickly. So basically, my uh, goal uh, with my research, I guess that's the question. So what would I like to change within the field? So I, I guess I hope for more uh, integration between the disciplines. Mm-hmm. So if you like, so from philosophy, I switch to anthropology. I do anthropology of science, but I try to integrate it with philosophy of science. But then I use feminist philosophy of science because that discipline integrates social studies of science and uh, more like more traditional type of philosophy of science. So like different kinds of integration are present in my own work. And then I also deal with integration. So I guess one of my goals would be to try somehow to find a language for the uh, disciplines that have been traditionally and historically divided. And then, yeah, so that's basically the thing. So uh, uh, recently when I started doing this reading about scientometrics, I also found out that scientometrics divided from this more micro uh, uh, perspective that's now characteristic for the social studies of science. So that, 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 that there is another division present. So basically, with my work, I would like somehow to try to integrate all the fields that have been previously divided due to some theoretical or, I don't know, political institutional reasons, and then to somehow, I don't know, bridge, uh, build a bridge for, for these previously undivided things. And maybe I would also like to make uh, feminist philosophy of science more popular and popularized, and uh, mostly because I think that their views on scientific objectivity will allow uh, uh, somehow they they uh, show that uh, being value laden doesn't mean that science is not credible enough and i think that the whole issue of why current uh, society distrusts science is because they believe that there are certain interests in the background of certain scientific uh, like scientific endeavors and then and that's also reasonable because if you like have the whole pharmaceutical industries that's funding certain types of uh, research then yes you have a very strong interest you have a, like a very strong you know like a pressure on the certain type of scientific knowledge and then you have like a, you're reasonably being uh, not 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 trusting so i guess and with this like a feminist philosophy of science it provides you with a theoretical like theoretical tools to better understand the relationship between science and society and to see that you have reasons to trust science even though some parts of science or all parts of science are value laden. You just have to see how these values are being used in scientific research. And in accordance to that, you will see whether you need you have to trust or distrust certain scientific products, let's say it like that. So basically, that that's my idea to maybe I would like to popularize uh, feminist philosophy of science, I think that really helps uh, when we think about the relationship between science and society. You beautifully put cool. I love that. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I think we'll probably end it there. Yeah. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you too.